Welcome everyone. We're here at London Valve, PCR London Valve 2023. And I'm Rebecca Hahn from Columbia University in New York. And I am joined today, I'm so lucky to be joined today by Anita Askar, who's uh, from Montreal Heart Institute, an interventional cardiologist. And then another interventional cardiologist, uh, Scott Lim, from two different universities, University of Virginia and University of British Columbia. And we're here today to discuss the big questions remaining in transcatheter tricuspid valve interventions. So welcome both of you. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining me. I'm gonna address the first question to Anita, and it's a big one. Where are we today in this field? I mean, what, you've been with it, this field, forever, um, and you've seen us transform, uh, and, and all of a sudden, you know, it's become a big deal. We actually have our own little session. I know, so it's a really exciting time, I think, for tricuspid valve disease. We've been talking about it for years, and I think it's finally found its place, and it's important in the treatment of valvular heart disease. So where we are now, I think we've recognized that tricuspid valve regurgitation primarily is a really important problem for patients. And we've progressed to the point where we have multiple potential devices available to treat those patients. They're being studied, you know, but there's a lot of questions remaining. Um, for me, when I break it down, I think about, well, patient selection, you know, who are the patients we need to be treating? And we're working on that, we're learning, but there's still, there's questions on who's too sick, who's not sick enough. And then the devices that we have available, do we use them in combination? Which one do we do first? So there's still, even though we've progressed, there's a lot there. And then trying to understand, make sense of the data that we have. You know, a lot of people are expecting we'd have mortality benefits in the data and we didn't see it. We see quality of life improvements across the board with whatever technology. But the question is, is that enough? And so there's still a lot left to answer, I think. Anita has raised many questions. And I just wanna ask you at least your thoughts on who are the patients that should be treated at this point with transcatheter devices? It's a great question. Uh, I would say the answer is we're still trying to figure that one out. Certainly, transcatheter repair has shown to be very, very safe. Transcatheter replacement, yielding a more complete elimination of the TR, is fairly close in safety, but perhaps uh, with some conduction disease issues, maybe not quite. And the question then is progression of that disease with repair technologies, you know, the leaflet's got to be closer together or, or the ability to get them closer together to do that type of repair. The jury is definitely farther out on annular technologies. And on replacement, we just have data, as Anita mentioned, on one of the devices, which potentially allows us to treat more patients with more progression of their disease. But it's still, since things haven't been compared head to head yet, um, still not clear fundamentally who are the patients we should be doing and who we shouldn't be doing yet. Are there patients that you think are too sick? Are, are there ones that you think um, at this particular time in where we are with transcatheter devices that, uh, that may not fall into a category that we can treat? It's a good question because uh, some of the data that's been presented suggests that the people that benefit the most are the ones that have that are the sickest, that have the greatest impairment of their quality of life seem to benefit the most. You know, we struggle on a daily basis when we see these patients trying to understand, you know, how important is the cirrhosis? How important is the liver failure? Who should we offer this to and who should we not? And, you know, that's what the heart team is for. And I think the heart team helps us to try to understand, but, um, you know, we're rethinking that. If we can improve their quality of life and they're the most impaired, maybe it's not as simple to say that they won't benefit. You know, I, I don't think I have the answer for that yet. Yeah, I know, Scott, you, you've dealt with a lot of different devices. And um, I mean, is, is, do you think that we will have an algorithm by which we can choose the best device for, for our patients? Yes, I do think we'll, we'll, we'll get there at some point, but that really calls to right now, we need to enroll more of these patients in clinical trials to get the data to find out where those guardrails are. Uh, generally speaking, I think repair technologies do better with lesser degrees of TR, although as Anita said, the more severe amounts of TR, those patients maybe have a more dramatic improvement. So uh, we're still trying to figure that one out. Yeah. What about outcomes? You mentioned, um, you know, that we have a trial, uh, uh, the first reported randomized trial that uh, shows mainly a benefit in the way the patients feel. So the KCCQ overall score. Right. 
and you, you question whether is that enough? How, what do you feel? How do you feel? So I think it's interesting because, you know, we've, cardiology is a field that loves randomized controlled trials and we love looking for this mortality benefit. That's what we're used to. But this really was the first, we're talking about the Triluminate trial, was the first trial, pivotal trial in tricuspid regurgitation. And so maybe there is no mortality benefit. We don't know. Maybe we didn't study it, you know, in the appropriate way, in the appropriate patients. But we as a field need to understand is, is quality of life improvement enough? Or do we need to find other ways to design these trials to find out who we might see a mortality benefit on? So I don't think we, we don't have the answer. And um, there's a lot of work to do to try to understand that. Yeah. And Scott, I, I know, have you seen these kind of benefits, the, the way the patients feel? Is this, is this a real finding? And do you think that that's enough then? Great question. Hard to answer the last part of your question, but the first, absolutely, on several, many of my patients, I've seen marked symptomatic improvement, even if we haven't completely eliminated the tricuspid regurgitation. One of the challenges we have, I think that you were pointing out, Anita, on the data is it wasn't compared to a sham you know, we, it was compared to a placebo, but there certainly can be a placebo effect that we don't yet know how much that changes the KCQ scores in this group of patients. So yes, all of this, we need a lot more work to really tease this out. Yeah, it seemed as though the medical therapy arm in the Triluminate trial also had some improvements. I mean, they had improvement in TR and also KCCQ. So it's, it's something we need to really investigate. We might not know enough about medical therapy. Mm -hmm. That's true for tricuspid regurgitation. It's, that's really something we need to study. So the last big question, where are we going from here? Where do you think the field of tricuspid valve interventions is, is, is headed? Well, I think it's a very exciting time because there's the interest, there's the technology, and there's the willingness to study these patients. I mean, we're headed towards more trials, trying to understand the outcomes better and understand patient selection better. So it's gonna be an exciting couple of years ahead. Yeah. I think it's an interesting question that you in particular are raising because I do think with the rise of tricuspid regurgitation therapies is tricuspid regurgitation imaging. Even to better understand which you've led the way on who these patients are and what our impact is, as well as technologies have arisen that we're now able to image in the procedure in different ways via a catheter or, or other things. So I think it's, a, as you said, it's an exciting time. We're in that steep part of that curve. Yeah, I do think we're on the steep part. I agree with you fully. I agree that it's the heart team that makes the decision. And in the procedure, it's a heart team also. So Absolutely. the imager and the interventionalist are working so closely together. Um, and it's very exciting for all of us at this table right now. So I thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, and I thank uh, PCR London Val for having us.